Oh, geez. Hey, guys, I want to introduce uh, my good friend, Jeff Merrill. We're going to have an interview with him today for the Pinion Podcast. This is going to be a little bit different from, uh, say, some of our other interviews, because Jeff and I are going to try and dive head deep into some troubling waters, man. Uh, Some things that uh, I think all of us need to talk about. We need to examine. We need to look at ourselves as well as uh, the situation that, you know, got us here. But what I want to do is I want to introduce Jeff. Now, Jeff is my, um, he's actually my first Christian roommate. If you've never had a Christian roommate, you probably aren't in a cult. Good for you. But also, uh, we... (laughs) We ended up uh, rooming together, and it was awesome, man. Uh, Jeff was one of the guys that showed me that you can be a normal human, have fun, and do your thing, and still love God. And I, to be honest with you, I didn't see that at first, and Jeff can attest to this, but uh, I was so, I don't know what you want to call it, overly focused. (laughs) I didn't enjoy much at all. I was, most of my young Christian experience was spent in tears (laughs) because I wasn't doing enough or trying hard enough or you know what the like but anyways i just introduced uh, jeff here jeff why don't you introduce yourself tell us what you do for a living brother yeah thanks alex i appreciate you having me on man i mean it's always good to connect with you and it's uh gosh i guess it's been uh about 20 20 plus years now since we were uh college roommates there in san diego at san diego uh city college that's right shout out to city college and then <laughs> Right. I mean, you've got to have some city. I mean, that's half the, the audience are probably your old ministry from city college. <laughs> if they uh, live in Latvia, then yeah. Yeah. And then was it, uh, is Golden Hill, Golden Hill. Is that, was that our first apartment that, uh, where we were roommates? Was it Golden Hill that we were on right by city college? I know it was by city college. I don't remember the name of that place other than worn down. That's what I would was call it. it. Probably. I think that was, uh, was it 49th and Broadway or something there it is. like that? That's 49th it, yeah. and Broadway. That's Golden <laughs> Hill. Yeah. That was our, uh, our apartment. So yeah, city college, I went on to graduate from San Diego state with a degree in finance and then, uh, immediately went into the mortgage business and have, uh, been steadfast in the mortgage business for the past 20, yeah, 20 something years. Oh, this is my 20th year actually. Right. On. And, um, you know, kind of wrote all the ups and downs of the market, right? The housing market, everybody kind of, it's hot right now. And people are, you know, uh, you know, feeding frenzy, they call it on, you know, home purchases and prices are going through the roof and interest rates are low and, you know, all the hype. There's a lot of, of that right now in the mortgage business, but yeah, I've been doing that for about, about 20 years. So uh, yeah, business-wise, that's what I'm doing, man. I've had a busy year and a half, right? And it's strange because you know, here 2020 comes along and people are getting laid off and losing their jobs. And, and honestly, when that started happening, I went, you know, oh, snap, like mortgage is business, it's shot. Like we're just going to have a slow time. It's going to, you know, die out here for a little while. And then immediately it was like, oh, actually, no, we're going to, you know, have records. <laughs> like, you know, we're, people are going to buy houses at record pace. <laughs> I remember my first home buyer after, uh, you know, COVID kind of started shutting things down here in California. Uh, was a teacher, right? And they had just sent all the kids home from school. And I'm thinking, this is the last person who's going to be buying a house right now. And yet she was like, well, I've got some time. I'm, you know, I'm home. So I got a little time to look into it. And so, (laughs) you know, I want to buy a house. I was like, okay. So people's attitudes towards home ownership and home buying was, you know, got stronger than ever. Now it's just a little bit crazy, but anyway, but that's what I do for a living. Well, I wanted to ask uh, Jeff that and get that out there because um, the topic of today's interview is the way we treat each other in many ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about wealth and uh, the lack thereof, okay? And so I figured we have the perfect uh, combination here. I can represent the lack thereof. And then, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm doing all right, folks. No, no, no prayers here, uh, unless, you, no, please, actually, I'll take that back. Please pray for me. <laughs> but My your goodness. GoFundMe link, go ahead and post that yeah. up right now. Your <laughs> GoFundMe, GoFundMe. <laughs> it says, please help. It's a picture of me and my children who are way too big for me to sell this as we're in need. But, uh, <laughs> now, I'll bring that up because, you know, that that's something I have uh, discovered recently. <clears throat> you guys know that I, I serve also as chaplain here with some uh, super seniors in town, uh, these uh, older individuals. And one thing I notice is uh, there's there's a, a kind of a trend to make fun of and mock the, the rich 
community. And I don't know, you know like I don't get too far into politics. I don't know if it's a red versus blue and this is the blue state. So we got to mock the red. I don't, I don't know where this stems from exactly, uh, but I just see it more and more prevalent. And I wanted to get Jeff on here because the, here's the truth. Jeff is a, a very committed Christian. He's been through some garbage, guys. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. I will later when I confess all of Jeffrey's sin on the <laughs> after show. <laughs> no, but <Yes>. he's <laughs> he has been through the ups and downs and remains. And uh, I just wouldn't want to see the church see that pendulum swing so much where all of a sudden we're treating people uh, we're kind of segregating. We're, we're, we say, you know, rich folks, you guys go over there and you 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 do your thing over there in that temple. We're going to be over here in our humble place because we're better. And I don't think just as much as I'm against the prosperity gospel, I would also be against the poverty gospel. I, I don't believe that's why yeah. Jesus came. Um, I don't think he came to show us how to live poor or rich. I don't think that was the point exactly because you see such a diverse mix. You got the zealot. He's crazy for the then you got Luke as a doctor. Come on, guys. These guys make our, uh, a decent living even back then. So, you know, they, these are some of the things I, I want to talk about. But I, I really want to talk a little bit about how not, not only staying faithful, but how the Christian faith has really molded Jeff into the position that he's in now. Because you're in a position where you, you make money uh, by way of uh, how much you sell, right? What a uh, commission, correct? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question. Let's jump in. How has your Christian training, and I'll tell you guys, you know, honestly, uh, when I was growing up in the faith, Jeff was one of the big time leaders, one of the guys I looked to. As a matter of fact, I only share this, uh, I only share this acronym or, or this little uh, title with two people. I think two people that I know can qualify as human cheat codes. And I think Jeff and my friend, Alex Garcia are one of them. Yes, Alex Garcia. He is Jeff and Alex agree. were 6'3 at birth. Uh, could dunk a basketball at seven. <laughs> I think Alex is six four or something like that, though. So Alex Garcia. So yeah, he's he's head and shoulders, and you know, he's a handsome man too. I mean, he is a handsome man. It's not fair to the rest of us, is what I'm trying to no. say, folks. But uh, <laughs> it turns out they have their own problems. So that that, that kind of makes me feel all right. But Jeff. What, what do you think, you know, some of the skills you've taken as a Christian leader, just a, your faith in general that has helped you uh, in the business world? Or has it? Yeah, good question. And, and, and funny because, you know, sent me these questions. And so I had a chance to think about them a little bit ahead of time. And, and um, I think really, when you talk about Christian leadership, if you're talking about it appropriately, you're talking about uh, Christian service, right? And so uh, you know, as a, as a leader in the church, you know, whoever wants to be the greatest will become your servant, right? And so if you really have a desire for, uh, for leadership, uh, the best thing to do would be to serve. And I would say that that has not always been the perspective. I think, you know, in church leadership, there can be mixed motives, um, you know, people who want to be, you know, looked up to, right? But if you really get down to like, what, what is true Christian leadership, you're talking about being a servant and being a servant then means going, Hey, what are, what are your needs? Like, what are your needs? What do you need from me? How can I help you? Um, how can I serve you? And, and ultimately if, if you uh, look out for the interest of others and then pick a profession that is doing something that you consider to be good, and then you apply, you know, a servant, you know, this, like a servant's attitude, uh, you're going to be wildly successful, right? Now here is an issue, right? I think that, well, if your motive really becomes to be wildly successful, then you start to lose that, you know, servant's heart, right? You, be, you start getting self, it starts to be more from a selfish motive. And so I think keeping the motivation with each individual client as how can I serve this person and, you know, help them achieve what they're trying, you know, to achieve, right? How can I, how can I do that? So I think, you know, ultimately in, in, in business, you know, the, the principles of, of service just become uh, so key, right? I think you could apply that to any profession and go, hey, if you're really trying to serve your customer base and do something good for them, um, you know, you'll likely be, you'll likely be successful in what you do. 
Something that's uh, just a great point that Jeff brings out. In fact, he shared this with me um, a few weeks ago. But Jeff mentions that he found something good. He found something good in the real estate industry. That see that that's my point is you can find good. You really can uh, if you can put yourself in a position where you understand the good that you're doing. Um, it doesn't really matter what other people think because you know a lot of times you could say that I'm a real estate agent and or I'm an attorney and you know the certain positions have a uh, a reputation that kind of comes with it, and you say oh great this guy. But I remember Jeff telling me uh, just, you know, personal advice to help me out at the time is you, you can't let people look down on things you approve of. This is from the book of Romans. And uh, I, I believe that this is true, guys. If you find a passion out there, you find something and it is, let's say, let's say it's an attorney. I'm trying to think of, the, you know, let's say it's a politician, right? You don't have to be like everybody else. You really don't. In fact, if you take a servant's attitude and servant's heart, I think it's surprising almost the success that you attain. I look at uh, some of the things that Jeff has uh, talked about here just, just right now, and I think immediately I, it all starts to make sense. It's like, yeah, you, you commit yourself to a life of service. So basically in the business world, he has still found a way to just follow Jesus. And I think that this is key and that we can all kind of get behind that and you can begin to celebrate success like this and you can begin to pursue success like this with, without a guilty conscience. And I think that that's so uh, that's going to really harm the church in the future is if all of us are trying so hard to be humble and in doing so, we find ways to make ourselves poorer. And I don't think that's the cause. There's always going to be the poor among you, but who's going to help the poor? Well, it can't be the poor, right? It's got to be someone that's in a position to actually serve them. So let me ask you this uh, question to follow up with that, Jeff. We talked about the benefits. <laughs> has there been times when I say your Christian faith has actually Maybe, you know, it felt like it hindered you in closing a deal or kind of pushing things forward, so to speak, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. I think I'm first inclined to say like, oh, yeah, you got to be moral. You got to make good choices. You got to be honest. You know, all those things. Right. And those are all true things. Like you should you should be moral and you should be honest and you should be truthful and you should give fair deals. And, you know, and all those things, those things are all, uh, you know, very important. But. I think that, um, you know, what I, where I, where I, where I think most, uh, what I think most about there is just, you know, what is your, what is your highest priority? Um, you know, and, and mortgage and real estate, uh, you could throw insurance, banking, you could throw a ton of different industries, you know, into uh, a category where it's like, well, those are pretty much about making money, right? I mean, that's kind of the main thing. That is kind of the main thing. Is that that is about you know making money sales is about you know can you sell more um you know all of those it's like yeah you want to be successful i remember uh right as college was kind of ending and i was getting my degree in finance but to be honest when i picked finance i didn't have like a career picked out you know um in fact i would say kind of during the last couple of years of college like my heart was pointing towards some sort of ministry job right uh, I, I, in fact, when I was in New Mexico, I spent 10 weeks in New Mexico as an intern at a college ministry, you know, in Las Cruces, right? Some of the best 10 weeks of my life. Like, man, I love New Mexico. I mean, I just <laughs> love New Mexico. And I remember one time in my senior year, I was, I actually was babysitting for some Christians and, um, they had this real nice house. I think it was in Tierra Santa, a suburb of San Diego, right? Real, real nice house, pretty new. And I remember thinking like, man, if I go into ministry, like I, I could likely never own a home like this, never going to, right? It's true. It's true. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's true. That's probably a true statement. Uh, but I'll probably never own a home like this. And that's okay. Like that's, that's fine. Because I really remember my heart being in a place where like, well, ministry was just the most important thing. Well, then a lot of things shifted in that year, right? The church changed a lot. There was a lot of different, there was a lot of movement. It became very clear that like full-time ministry, that was not going to be the immediate path. So it was time to get a job and, uh, you know, kind of, honestly, I would say God led me into the profession that I'm in um, and then started to teach me, uh, you know, that you can still do ministry as, you know, a person with a job. And in fact, even recently, I would say God has been teaching me that, hey, it's probably better for you, Jeff, to do ministry 
and not get paid for it, right? I think that there's a unique challenge that comes with getting paid to be in ministry. I mean, a unique challenge, like, you know, your, your motivation, right? Where, why are you doing this? Uh, all of a sudden the scrutiny, right? So people look, are gonna look at you differently and be like, well, I don't know, we're, you're, you know, I'm, I'm writing a check that's, you know, make it that you're cashing and, you know, that's what you live off of. And so I have a certain expectation of you, uh, or at least that's how I felt in ministry. Sure. Like, okay, I need to be a little bit extra above board. Uh, I need to probably sin a little bit less, right? I mean, I probably need to be like a better example. Uh, and you can make arguments for all of those things to be, you know, to be true. And yet it was like, man, but my, the motivation of it all, like, I love what I do now. Like I serve in, like I'm a Sunday school teacher. Uh, I teach 10 year olds. Uh, in fact, this next week, I'm a camp counselor for a week up at the, you know, camp for these little 10 year old kids, just, you know, teaching them the gospel and telling them how much Jesus loves them. And for me, being a person who's, you know, full of ego and pride, I mean, that would be a struggle, right? That would be something that, you know, ego and pride would be uh, an issue for me. Like, oh man, just to serve kids and, you know, tell them about Jesus is, is something I find, you know, to be the most valuable thing that I can be doing with my time. Yeah. Uh, and also investing, you know, investing money in that. I think I, I don't know that I went to the dollar store to prepare for camp yesterday and it's outrageous the number of glow sticks and balloons and boxes of candy and the different things that you know I'm getting. Uh, anyway, go, going back to you know full time you know full time ministry, like man, you can you can do ministry in a really special way when you are not in the ministry, Amen. and yet I think when you're uh, or not in the ministry, meaning you know being a, a paid pastor or a paid staff you know person. Um, is it hard to? Yeah, like it's totally hard to. I mean, keeping your priorities uh, in line, right? When it comes to, you know, your, your job and, uh, you know, your family, um, all those things are important, but, you know, to still live out the Great Commission and, you know, be sharing the love of Jesus with people, uh, you know, you can do that, you know, rich or poor. Amen. Um, anyway, did that answer your question? I don't remember what the original question was. I think we might have gotten off of that a little bit. Not at all, but that was beautiful. <laughs> I'm sure the good people over in Estonia appreciate that comment there. The story. <laughs> Shout out to Estonia. Well, here's, here's, let me ask this question. Let me rephrase it. <clears throat> so think about that. I, I love what Jeff said here is, especially if you're a young male woman, I don't, it doesn't matter, male, female, brother, sister, and you want to go into, you're trying, you're striving and you know, the ministry can, depending on your church and how they phrase it, it can look very attractive. It can look very attractive. I know, uh, you know, my story is a little bit different than Jeffrey's, as you guys know, is uh, I, I, I didn't want the ministry. I, I, I thought I did um, at first. And then I just kind of, I don't know, I kind of took a step back and I looked around and I, I, did, I was like, do I want to be, and I, I don't want to throw out names, but the leaders that were, were here, I wanted to be like Jeff, don't get me wrong. Uh, I wanted, there was certain, like Dave Martin carried himself as just a joyful spirit and thing. And I said, okay, amen. But uh, after looking around too, I, I would see like the ins and outs of ministry and the ins and outs of ministry, guys, um, I hate to be the one that brings this up, but sometimes it can feel very business-like and it can even look that way. And the reason is, is because you are in fact operating secularly a nonprofit organization and certain things have to get done in order to maintain the church. I know no one likes to hear these things. And believe me, I'm the last one that wants to even tell you these things, but it is true. And so the ministry actually can prepare you and ready you for a path that maybe you weren't thinking about. Because I think about this often, if all of us were in the same boat, if we consider unity to be a matter of what you did, then we'd all be tent makers, right? Because Paul was a tent maker. Or we'd all be, <laughs> I dare say we'd all be little messiahs because that's what Jesus was. No, I, I think that we, we're missing the boat here is that we need every unity through diversity. We want all nations, amen. But we also want diversity in so many different backgrounds. If someone gets hurt, you're going to want to go to the doctor, right? What if your doctor was a Christian? That's reassuring. That brings a, an added level of comfort. What if you're sitting there, you want to get a house, but you're a little unsure. It's very reassuring to be able to go to your brother in Christ 
who is not going to try and, you know, do something immoral or anything, but he's going to treat you as a brother, but he's also going to give you the business part. He's also going to show you the other side. I think we need this. So striving to be a pastor, a, a preacher, teacher, minister, I think that's beautiful. Um, but I do think this more all times than not is that if God wants you in that position, there's really little you can do. And I know because I've run, I've tried to do different things. I've tried to go out. I, I know I'm capable of making a good deal of money uh, and amen for it. Amen for it. But I'm not happy this way. My, my pursuits have got, to, I'm just, I'm built this way and I'm designed this way. And it's okay. So Jeff and I can still be all right together. <laughs> so let me ask you this, Jeff, what has been a hindrance uh, to the business world with your career, have there been any hangups like, man, I feel guilty or, uh, you know, have I gone too far? You know, what, what are some of the challenges you face as a Christian, also as a very successful uh, real estate agent? Yeah, I think uh, mortgage broker, I should say. I'm, mortgage I'm so guy, sorry. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mortgage guy. Steve mortgages. Um, you know, the hindrance. OK. And when I say hindrance, uh, Okay, if you're in the bit in the business just from a you know secular point of view, like it's competitive. The goal is to win, and the goal is to uh, make as much money as you possibly can, right? Um, and many people in our business are driven that way. They want to you know get super rich. And that is you know you could do it. Um, as far as hindrance to success, like a Christian attitude in business can be a hindrance to success in a sense in that well, that's not really that important to me. Like that is not that important to be, to be uh, number one. It is not um, that important to me to set some new record. It is not that important to me to make, you know, a million bucks. Like it's just not that important. And I think this is, you know, as, as a Christian, this is like, I think in every human heart, every human heart uh, has an ultimate longing for God. And the mistake that most people make is trying to fill that hole up with something else. And, you know, for, um, for so many men, it's like, hey, I'm trying to fill that hole with success and achievement uh, and money, which equals security, uh, which means, hey, I don't have to rely on God as much. And so I would say, like, yeah, it's a hindrance in a way, because it's like, well, if you, be, if, if you really are trying to make a you know, ton of money then and your, added, your Christian attitude about money is not necessarily going to help you do that, <laughs> right? So a Christian <laughs> attitude about money puts it in the proper place and goes like, oh yeah, it's a great blessing. Like, it's great. You know, it's, it's great to be able to provide for my family. It's great to be generous to others. Um, you know, all those, all those things are, are great. Um, I always think about uh, the scripture that says, you know, use worldly wealth to get friends. <laughs> I'm Amen. Like, oh yeah, like, <laughs> hey, pick up the tab, right? I mean, pick up the tab, pay for dinner. Uh, I mean, encourage your friends with, you know, in which ways you can by using your, you know, by using what God is, you know, what God is giving you. Amen. Uh, and the Bible certainly speaks so much about wealth. And so it's like, man, if you are a Christian in a money making industry, you better make sure that 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 stays in its proper place. Right. Keep that uh, in its proper place and keep the main thing, the main thing. Right. Uh, you know, keep fixing your eyes on Jesus and just realize that, like, Hey, your money's not that important. So as you approach business and, you know, in a competitive, hey, make money, work hard, you know, hustle, hustle with, an, with a Christian attitude of, ah, yeah, but it's really not that important. <laughs> like, guys, like, let's be honest, like, this <laughs> really making more money is really not that important. Um, that would be a hindrance to success in the business. That makes sense. Amen. Well, I think about this. Uh, first of all, <laughs> let's not make any mistake about this. Jeff is very successful. <laughs> And yet he's found a way to do that without having, um, you know, just that competitive, I got I to gotta cut you if necessary. <laughs> I've got to get to the top. You don't know. Uh, this is the way I'm built. And he's found a way to do that. And he still has his eyes on, on God and what's important. And, and here's, here's why I think Jeff has a job to this day. Not only the success part. I've watched, uh, you know, the, I'm not much on the, to Facebook, uh, but I get on there all the time, you know, because I, I, that's the only way I can keep up. I'm from San Diego, but I live in New Mexico. So I don't, I don't get to see anybody I grew up with, you know, except through Facebook. And I see these pictures of Jeff with his uh, Sierra mortgage, uh, his, his crew. And Jeff is always smiling. The people around him, they like, and they, they'll put, he'll put a picture up there of Sierra more, and then he'll have comments throughout. And these things stand out to me. 
I have always been, I like, I, I hate to sound like I've been stalking, but it sounds like that. But I look at the comments and they're from his coworkers and they love being around him. Well, let me, can, I, can I talk on that for half a second? So Because I was completely wrong. Only only talk on this if I was completely wrong and you're actually <laughs> vile and, dis and despised. They, they hate me. They, I, I'm like, listen, Please you're going to smile then. for this photo. <laughs> and if you, listen, I'll give you a bonus if you post something nice on the Facebook post about me, right? No, I'm kidding. I think we built, uh, you know, I have a business partner and we built our little office on uh, a principle that was not money focused in a money focused industry. We were like, hey, let's make sure that these people have a job. Like, let's make sure that everyone who works for us is well taken care of and comes to a place where they can, yeah, be as successful as they want to be, meaning mostly in their life. Like, what do you want? In, what do you want out of your life? You want to, uh, you know, work really hard and, you know, so you can buy a house and buy a nice thing. That's fine. You can do that here. Uh, you want to make enough, you know, just to support your family and be able to enjoy your life. And you're going to do that in 20 hours a week. Well, you can do that here too. Um, and, you know, it's really about you achieving your goals and us supporting you in that. Um, and so it just became a, a, a place where people could be safe in employment uh, and yeah, experience some success and really enjoy one another. And so, yeah, it's very true. Like we uh, have, a, have great times together, really enjoy one another, are there to support one another. And, um, and, and we built our office on that principle. And I think, uh, you know, I think our, we've been rather successful just because, man, that's what's most, that is still the highest priority, right? That's the highest priority, you know, instead of, you know, ultimately the bottom line, right? Uh, so the highest priority is the people. It, it's so obvious. It, it comes across as evident, even though I've never stepped foot inside the, uh, hopefully one day, Bonnie and I just show up and be like, we're ready to buy a house. Here. So, yeah. Frizz, we'll yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, I, it's, it, it comes across to me as, as very, very obvious. But let me ask you this question. I, I think this is an interesting dynamic because if I were to introduce Jeff just simply as a rich white guy, <laughs> I think he would have gotten some heat. I think we would have been like, I don't want to hear this. But think about what Jeff said just now. He's in this business. And yes, the business has been successful, but it's modeled after people first where do you find that well you find that in your faith you find that that that's where that comes from that's where we get that from how do i put others people people first and it, now all of a sudden i think the christian is left in a real dilemma like i wanted to not like him because he's wealthy and he has things i do not but look at this guy trying to make sure people's families are fed look at him take responsibility even at the expense of the bottom line could he have made much more money? Yeah, the, the truth is yes. You can. <laughs> you don't have to have 20 hour workers. <laughs> you can just like, hey, it's a, we're a 40 hour or a little bit over that if we're being honest. But they haven't designed the, the ministry or I, I call it a ministry, but they haven't designed the office like this. So let me, let me ask this question, Jeff, because I think this is um, vital because we all have this. What is it, and this doesn't have to necessarily be business related, but what is it that brings you back to God on your knees. I mean, just the times where, God, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. I'm, I'm lost. Yeah, I think, um, well, and I'll comment on business, the business side of it first, and then, you know, and then take that, take it to the personal side, uh, you know, on the business side. And I would say this to people who would consider themselves poor, right? You consider yourself poor or whether you consider yourself rich, guess what? You're never going to be fulfilled by making more money like you just are not ever going to be fulfilled by making more or having more money it's just not true right now i think the bible would teach that you can look at solomon and all of the things that he's like oh i tried this and 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 gosh dang it just didn't bring any satisfaction ultimately it's god right ultimately it's god and so uh you can learn that lesson one of two ways you can learn it by reading the bible and trusting god's word and recognizing that as a truth uh, or you can go and, you know, chase things and then you'll experience that. So you'll achieve things and you'll go, oh, this didn't really fulfill me either. Right. It didn't really fulfill me either here. So, you know, to, uh, you know, to put wealth in perspective and to put, you know, things in perspective. So, so important because you could be bitter. You could be poor and bitter towards people who have wealth or you could have wealth consider yourself, you know, on some higher level than the poor, 
uh, and, and both people would be in error, right? Both people would be in error. I got to think about this in these, you know, questions where it's, you know, when, when you really uh, look at the makeup of the church, you go, man, rich and poor are right next to one another. And, and I go to a great church. It's in a healthy stage, right? It's in a healthy stage of growth. I love my church, uh, Clovis Hills Community Church in Clovis, California. Uh, just give a shout out to them. It's a healthy church, right? And it's got its problems. I mean, there's, you know, just like any, any church has, you know, problems. Well, you're um, in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's at least one significant problem uh, that's there. But there was uh, the guy who kind of runs the greeting team, okay? The people who greet you in the parking lot or greet you out front and just, you know, say good morning as, and, and everything as folks are coming in, uh, whether it's handing out bulletins or just being that, that first, um, you know, person to smile and make eye contact with a, with a visitor uh, or someone coming to church for this, or, or just even, you know, you know if, to everyone. That he commented on how, he says, I have members on my team who probably have a $10 million net worth. They run a business, they got a ton of, I mean, they've been very successful. And then I have members of my team that are the opposite, right? Where they, they have nothing. I mean, they have nothing as far as, um, you know, financial or material wealth. And you can't tell which one is which. That's beautiful. And I was like, oh, that's a healthy, I mean, that is a great and healthy team right there where it's like, man, you can have the rich and poor and you cannot tell which it. one is which because they're serving right alongside one another as brothers and sisters. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think I have been poor, right? We were in yep. college. We, oh, we, man, we lived in a, our apartment had roaches. Do you remember it having roaches? Our apartment was, all right. Guys, let me segue real quick. Um, I gave up a condo share. I owned a condo and then I gave the proceeds, uh, you know, later on to the church. But I, I had a, I was living nice, man. I, <laughs> I had a little place in uh, Hillcrest, which is a little sub community of, of San Diego. I was doing well. And then they asked me to move over there and I just looked around. And I was like, only for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the best place. We, <laughs> we were poor. No, yeah, these. Well, I don't even know if they were roaches. They were like little tiny roaches and they would just like infest the kitchen. And it, was, and it wasn't, I mean, there might've been times where you could have blamed the dirtiness of our kitchen, but <laughs> it really had a lot more to do with the building. And um, anyway, so we've been poor, right? I mean, you know, you know what it's like to have uh, next to nothing. Um, and, you know, and to have, so to have, you know, success, right? Or if you want to call it, um, if you want to call it that, and to have enough now, like I don't have roaches, at least not right now. Don't do not have roaches in my house. Yeah, praise God. And um, man, to to have to really have and see both sides of that, uh, neither one makes you happier or more sad. Uh, it, neither one really makes you feel more fulfilled or less fulfilled. Um, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I think people should work hard. And if you work hard in the profession that you've chosen, like you're going to, and you apply sound, um, you know, biblical financial principles, like you can keep your debt low, you can keep your credit score up, you can keep, uh, you know, a reserve fund, all the Dave Ramsey Christian principles, right? right? So, I mean, you can, you can really apply those things to your money, whether you're rich or whether you're, you're, you're poor, you know, being wise with what you've been given, um, I think is, you know, whether you have a lot or whether you have a little, be a good steward of what you have um, and be generous, right? Ultimately, whether you're rich or poor, like be generous to others. And, and you know, I think in that you really are doing what's right with your, you know, with your money. Um, but, but relationally, right, where that's, you know, starts to divide people is just our sinful attitudes about, you know, whether we're rich or whether uh, or whether we're poor. So I don't know. I think it, 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 it's funny because it's almost something that I go, oh, you know, I don't even think about that all that often. I don't really think about, you know, how much I do or don't have really all that often. Um, it doesn't hold a very high place in my heart. Uh, now, you know, if God tested me or allowed me to be tested in the way that Job was tested and everything was taken away in a day, 
how would you feel about that? Well, yeah, I'd be upsetting, man. I worked hard for the life that I, you know, have, right? Uh, that would be upsetting. But ultimately, I would hope that my heart would come to a place where it says, what is it, you know, naked I came into the world, naked I'm going out, like, hey, God giveth and God taketh away, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> so, it, it, and, and, and let's do that together, um, man, because there are so many things to divide us. So rich or poor, and, and man, I was listening to this great message this morning by Tim Keller. Oh. And, you know, he was specifically talking about the crucifixion of Christ in uh, the book of Luke, right? And, and he was breaking down the people who started to get it, really. Okay, so first person who starts to really get it while Jesus is on the cross is the thief right next to him, right? And Tim, and Tim Keller went on to describe it. He's like, this was more than a thief. This wasn't just someone who like, you know, stole some bread from the marketplace. Like this person is being crucified because he probably robbed and killed somebody, right? That's most likely, you know, what's shaken out. This is a bad, bad man. Bad person. But he's the first one to start getting it, right? So he's like, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus is like, yeah, you'll be with me in paradise. First person who starts to get it. Uh, it then goes on to mention, uh, you know, the women who were there. They're, you know, and they start to get it, Right. And, and I would bring that up going, okay, well, that's the marginalized in society, certainly in that society, uh, the marginalized. Ultimately, on down the road, right, at the very end of the crucifixion story, who takes his body to the grave? Joseph of Arimathea, right? That's a rich right. guy. That's it. Right? So it's like we start off with the thief, right. right? The one who is like, man, the worst of the worst. We go to the marginalized of society and on down, and eventually the rich guy gets it. Right. So eventually the rich guy is like, oh, OK, Jesus, I like, that's what it's all about. Oh, OK, now I get it. And you go, well, which which person do you want to be? Like you want to be the person who gets it late in the game. Right. You 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 know, the the thief or the, the rotten person. OK, let's all identify with that, though, for a minute. Right. So we can all identify with the rotten thief on the cross, uh, you know, the hatred in our hearts and all the, you know, uh, thievery and, you know, uh, I mean, you name it, right? We're, we're bad people. I'm a bad person. I, I am that. I am. I identify with the thief. Um, and on down the road, right? I mean, you can identify with, you know, the various people in the story of, uh, you know, of the crucifixion. But, you know, ultimately, the rich guy is the last guy who got it and went, okay, you know, I'm going to take the body of Jesus and, and I'm going to bury it. And I'm going to take care of some things around here, uh, you know, that need to be taken, you know, care of. Um, but there is no advantage. In fact, I would say if your priority is closeness to Christ, right? High priority. Uh, your wealth is only going to hinder you. Or is most likely to hinder you, if anything. Right. So, all right, well, let's stop chasing after that then. Because that's only going to hinder my connection to understanding of and relationship with God. So, yeah, put it in its proper perspective. It doesn't mean that, you know, the rich person can't. It's not impossible. You know, I think with the, the whole story of the, it's easier for the, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And we could break down that story and what it really means. It just means like, hey, it's hard for a rich guy to get into heaven, right? It's, and I think that it's because it's hard for him or her to put their heart or to put Jesus in the proper position in their heart right. uh, to have a true relationship with him. Yeah, I think another good point that we we uh, didn't bring up is, um, well, first of all, let me talk about the point that you did bring up, which I thought was fascinating. Once again, you did not answer the question, but I thought this was even better than the question I came up with. My goodness. But that Tim, Ke I, I got to go through that again. Um, I am a big fan of Tim Keller, like you guys know, but uh, I think about the influence that Christ had. Uh, it was obviously it didn't matter. Obviously. It was not just a message to the poor, right? Because here's Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy guy, and he's the one. Think about this. Jesus wouldn't have had a burial spot. That would have been left up to the government of Rome. That would have been left up to, uh, you know, Pontius Pilate. Instead, this man steps up because he has the means. He already has a cave, which was kind of a big deal in Israel. Uh, that definitely was a sign of wealth, is that you are ready to, uh, to pass away <laughs> and go into the next uh, phase of eternal life. 
Oh, can so, I say something about this? Actually, about Joseph of Arimathea, real quick, which is just kind of interesting. I would love so to. So yeah. Arimathea is like halfway in between um, Joppa, okay, where Jonah, I think Jonah getting on the so on the coast, halfway between Joppa and Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah. And so you know, he I don't know, he's a days or two what whatever walk outside of Jerusalem, but owns a tomb there, right? And if you ever go to Jerusalem, there's all these tombs around Jerusalem. Like if you are a Jew, like being, you know, buried in Jerusalem is a huge deal, right? So he has this tomb in Jerusalem that's a couple days, you know, walk away from where he lives because being buried there is important. Like I could not even imagine how much it would cost to buy a, at this point anyway, and pro- and then also, right, to be, you know, owning a tomb or a burial spot, uh, you know, just outside of Jerusalem. And if you understand or know about, you know, uh, Hebrew or Jewish culture, like it costs an arm and a leg. Like this guy, deal. you know, man gave Jesus an expensive plot of land, um, you know, to bury him. So, I mean, it's just kind of interesting. This rich guy actually bought a tomb in Jerusalem, you know, for, uh, you know, a couple of days away from where he actually lived. And then, um, you know, it, it, he was a very wealthy, very wealthy guy. Now it also mentions though, that he's in the Sanhedrin, right? So Joseph of Arimathea, it says he did not consent to the decision to crucify Jesus. Well, you don't see Joseph of Arimathea, though, standing up and saying, no, no, don't crucify him, don't crucify him. It's like, I'm just not giving my consent, right? He did not protest, really, the crucifixion of Jesus. He got it because, I mean, he started to understand Jesus, you know, kind of late. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, af- after he was crucified. Uh, but yeah, rich guy, um, and you know, giving his giving the tomb up to Jesus, uh, you know, was was a big deal. That's a big deal, especially because it was never intended for Jesus. It was intended for his use, for his family. Uh, that was purchased from his wealth. His influence bought that, and he was willing to give it to Christ. Not no, because he yeah, sure he got it, but I doubt that he understood the resurrection part. <laughs> and I don't think he knew that he was just loaning this uh, cave to Jesus. I think he had thought in his mind, well, you know, I bought this. It it didn't work out for me, but this is the right thing to do. And he was willing to put his money where his mouth was. I thought that's, I've always been impressed by Joseph of Arimathea. And it just, it's a, another example, I think of just putting your faith in Christ first, despite, gosh, man, this, again, this was not meant, this was not intended for Jesus. It was a gift given to Jesus. But I look at that example, the thief on the cross is a filthy, these are the guys that we relate to, right? When we say sinner, we often think of the thief on the cross or, or something like this, because it's nice to be able to put a real genuine bad guy up there and compare yourself to him. Um, it's easier that way. Cause it's like, well, Hey, at least I'm not Hitler. <laughs> at least I'm not the guy on the cross. Right. But no, it's, it's amazing how Jesus would reach out to this guy, just as he always had, as he was always out there for the poor, always trying to help. And at the same time, here's this guy from the Sanhedrin. And we don't hear too much about that. But the, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the, of the time, right? The Sanhedrin, these are the guys that got to operate with Rome. These are the guys that were rule makers. These are the guys that can have influence on, say, like a Pontius Pilate, sharing their cultural beliefs along with and kind of conforming them to Rome. These were your politicians of the day. So here's the guy who's the worst of the worst. He's not even a Pharisee. The Pharisees got a better shake than the Sanhedrin, (laughs) but he's not, he's a Sadducee. And he still, Jesus still impacted this man. He impacted him so much that he he didn't consent to this. Maybe, you know, maybe he had his own reason. I don't know. We can't go back in time and figure this out, but I just look at that. And I say to myself, man, look at the reach of Jesus. This was not a message just to Jews. We know that or else he wouldn't have said all nations. It wasn't a message just to the poor. We know that because of Joseph Arimathea. And there's so many examples. Guys, remember Isaiah was a statesman. Okay. He was not a poor guy. Let's, uh, you know, you got to look at these things. Paul chose that life, but let's remember Paul was educated man. He had Roman citizenship. He could have done very well. So let me ask you this question, Jeff, and we'll start to wind down a little bit. What are the things that bring you back to your knees? Um, that's I, I've always been curious about that. Is what what is it that makes you hurt and struggle for this world, for yourself, for your family, to a point where you say, I, I gotta, I gotta pray through this. I gotta talk to God about this. Uh, I 
I think when it's all said and done, uh, whatever, whatever success is, right? And I would say the God, this is true about the gospel. The gospel is not for the rich and it's not for the poor. Uh, it's just for, for all of us. And, you know, whether you realize that, you know, wealth is meaningless or whether you, uh, you know, are still chasing it a little bit, right? Maybe you're rich and you're chasing it. Maybe you're poor and you're, and you're chasing it. Um, that needs to get put in its proper place, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, like we're sinners in need of a savior. Amen. We are sinners in need of a savior. And when we, when we humble ourselves in that way, right? And, and first you got to put aside all the, you know, I'm going to, you know, whether I'm going to do great things for God or, or not, right? Those achievements or sacrifices, uh, none of those things earn you a spot closer to God, right? It's, it's the fact that Jesus died for you. He died for you. He loved you so much that he died for you. And it's that sacrifice that brings us, you know, to God. And, and we ought to do, you know, good works. We ought to serve, you know, uh, whether that's serving the poor or whether that's serving the, or whether that's serving rich who are poor in other areas. Uh, you know, we serve one another, you know, hoping ultimately that people, you know, make the choice to, you know, turn to God and turn to Jesus. So, I don't know, I think that, um, you know, to put aside the discussion of, you know, a, I'm a person is successful and wealthy because there's many godly, wealthy men in the Bible. Now, when you say godly, right, you talk about King David, who did some terrible things. You talk about Abraham, who did some terrible things. You talk about, right, a number of people, including, you know, the apostles, Peter, who did some, you know, terrible and <laughs> stupid things, denying Jesus and all, right? Um, you know, but, but ultimately, like, hey, all that stuff, man, set it aside and, and, and recognize that, um, you know, the gospel of Christ is for all of us. Amen. And we have an awful lot more in common than we have differences. Hey, that's it. So you and I could, um, you know, one of our pastimes in the, the apartment there on 49th and Broadway is we take a football. And okay, this football actually is funny. There's a funny story. This football, it was a legitimate NFL football. Do you remember this? Oh, I do. So it was like an authentic NFL football. And I had had it autographed by Junior Seau, right? Junior Seau at the time, when he was like a rookie, I'd met him out in, uh, at a golf course, you know, rich guy problems, right? Meeting, meeting celebrities <laughs> at golf courses. That's awesome. And uh, so I've had Junior Seau sign this football. So we, we'd toss this football back and forth and we'd have some of the best, yeah. really, in, in spiritual, you know, talks that I would say, really ultimately sent us in the directions that we went in our faith. Agreed. Right. And times during that would have sent you in the direction that you've uh, been sent in serving God in the way that you are. And, you know, same thing, right. We're being formed in those, in those, in that relationship, a relationship that was based on and formed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. That's it. Yeah. Uh, the fact that Jesus died for us and you know, that we're both, rotten sinners in need of a savior like man we we're stupid back then i mean I, yes I, we were we had we had lots of problems we made lots of bad choices we made lots of mistakes in our lives and in ministry right um you know but ultimately the commonality the gospel was for both of us that's right uh, and the gospel was for all of us that's right so you know rich or poor in whatever position you're you're in uh share the gospel that's it because it's just the most important thing in the world. Um, so yeah, man, I, I, I appreciate getting to talk about this a little bit. I think it's, it's a little bit funny and I wasn't prepared it, it, for when you first brought up the topic, I went, oh, that's weird. Like, oh, I didn't think of myself. I didn't think that I was being perceived in that way. And, and, and I certainly wouldn't want to be identified in that way. Okay, and I think the, word, the, the term rich Christian you know, and I would go, oh, there's there, words, have, words mean things. And what comes first is important. So, you know, a Christian who is wealthy or a Christian who, uh, you know, is rich, right? Well, you're a Christian first. 
Amen. Um, yeah. and, and so to say poor Christian or rich Christian, it's like, ah, flip that around and just go like, well, we're Christians first, right? We're brothers and sisters, um, you know, we're brothers and sisters first. And so when, when these things that are, you know, not that important, like wealth, like if you, if you put them in the wrong position, yeah, they become an important thing and they divide us. I would probably say the same thing is true about politics. The same thing is true about race. The same thing is true about, right? If you put those things first, they're going to divide us, right? Yeah, we've seen But it. when you put those things into perspective and just go, yeah, I'm Caucasian. I haven't done an ancestry.com. I should do that at some point. Find out what I really am. I don't know. I've <laughs> always been, I'm told I'm white and I identify that way and looks that way. Um, you know, but but I would have never thought of that being something that would divide me from you. Right. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. That doesn't divide me from you. Now, truth be told, you and I probably would not have ended up friends had it not been for the gospel, right? Sure. Yeah, we probably yeah. were not in the same circle of people at that particular different paths. time. We, yeah. <laughs> we were on different paths. You know, we would have not likely bumped into each other. Um, but the gospel brought us together. And, and really, isn't that true? Like, man, because of the gospel, you've met such a diverse group of people and have such a diverse, uh, you know, group of friends. And I celebrate that diversity, right? The diversity of my friend group. Yeah. Um, but I don't think about it very much. Right. 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 I, mean, I kind of yeah. go like, no, that is my friend group. Like those are the people that I love and that I share great experiences in, uh, my life. And, and I would encourage people who would consider themselves Christians who are poor or Christians who are rich to, to reach, reach across the aisle, I guess, in, yeah. in certain ways, you know, r- Christians who are rich, like be generous in the ways that you're able. Yeah. And Christians who are poor, like, Hey, don't think of yourself right. more highly or lowly than you ought. Right. Right. You're no one, none of us have a, you know, have really a, any, any reason to boast. I mean, what, what reason do you have to boast? I mean, should a Christian who's rich boast in that? I don't know. I would say that would be stupid yeah. right? in the world. And I think if this is one of your written questions, like in the world is like, that's a status symbol. Right. Uh, but even though we're, and I, cause I think this is in the human heart. We're a little bit offended every time somebody posts something about like, you know, here's a picture of my brand new Corvette, right? Here's a picture of my yacht. I mean, even, even people who are not Christians are a little bit offended by I... it's like, uh, what that's ridiculous. Right. And because I think that that that's just in our hearts to recognize like, oh, guy, that's not that's not that impressive. That's not that important. <laughs> um, you know, and so to have, you know, to have uh, jealousy of a person who has something like uh, you don't even know what you you don't even know. Like, you don't yeah. know that that's that is not what you really want. You don't want that. And you never know what the other individual is going through. There are times. um you know, and I, I think I can say this and uh, about about you or anybody else, but there's times where it doesn't matter how much money you have. I wouldn't want to switch positions with you at all. Uh, cool. There's times where I've seen uh, wealthy individuals go through extreme pain, extreme sorrow. And the reason is, is because they're humans, guys. Uh, I think that something Jeff did earlier here is he put a beautiful summation on this. The struggle is struggle, okay? Sin is sin, whether you're wealthy or whether you're poor. That's why Jesus came, is we needed a redeemer. We have, we, all of us. So to become a Christian, the one defining quality that you have to have outside of confession, Jesus is Lord, (laughs) and in my understanding, baptism. But uh, when it it really is, you, you have to identify as a sinner. You have to at least understand that you have sin that needs forgiveness that uh, is in need of redemption. And this is what really draws us together, guys. This is what really brings us together, because it really doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or whether you're poor. Sin will infect. Sin will, it, it's the enemy, not us. We're, it's an old saying, guys, from the South. You know, I told you I'm from Florida. An old saying is the old ladies that tell you, like, you never hate the sinner, but you always hate the sin, because sin is the enemy not your brother or sister, regardless of what they have. And maybe they're not doing the things that Jeff is doing. And so it's easy for you to point out, but I bet there's areas in your own life that you need to improve in. And I think my bottom line for this um, situation would be, I I just, I think we all have to remember who we are in Christ. Um, And I love what Jeff said earlier, put Christian first. 
prioritize your life in this way. And I think that it, it sets a solid foundation. I'll share this uh, brief story. Um, and I think Jeff will like it because I didn't know anything about, uh, we, you know, we grew up in the same church and you guys know I love the campus ministry. That was my, that was my jam. Uh, I loved City College, everything about, I had a great time. Uh, I went to New Mexico State after that and then uh, Biola and Grand Canyon University. I mean, I, I love, I love college. I, I, I love the experience, all of that. And I thought, you know, you see the other things, but they, I was asked one day to uh, lead the singles. And some of you can relate to this in many of your churches. The singles are kind of the ministry. They're like, ah, <laughs> man. All right. I'll, I guess I'll do it. But you're not real pumped up about it because you know that they're not too pumped up about it. And it's because we did somehow, just as we do with rich or poor, we put a title on these guys that being single is a bad thing. That being, and so they're not treated the best at times. And this is the same distinction that we've got to get over. We've got to see ourselves for what we are. And that is, you were, remember, guys, whether you're wealthy or not, you were the poor baby that was on the side of the road that was bloody. It was gross. It was disgusting. And people passed by. No one stopped for you except Jesus. And Jesus not only cleansed you, he not only redeemed you, but then he wrapped you in the finest of white linen, and we call it his righteousness. So it's as if you never in your life have ever sinned. None of us deserve that. None of us can give enough or sacrifice enough to kind of call that one even. And if we can see that with each other, I think we can. I think we can start to put Christ first. I think we can recognize ourselves not as rich or poor Christians, not as Democrat Christians, not as Republican Christians, but a Christian who understands the Republican way of finance or a Christian that understands the Democratic way of uh, service to people. And you can appreciate that and not hate your brother for having a different view because you recognize that same brother, that same sister is in your same boat, a sinner in desperate need of salvation, in desperate need of forgiveness. Guys, this has uh, been the Opinion Podcast. Uh, I want to thank Jeff again for sitting down with me. These are uh, these guys, like I said before, these are conversations that we would normally have. I mean, I, I would have probably made fun of him a little bit more and he, he the same with me. But <laughs> this is <laughs> this is essentially what we, you know, kind of talk about. We just shoot through the things uh, you know, when I when I find myself in uh, a position where I need to either get advice or I'm feeling uh, down about something, I have no problem calling Jeff. Um, and I never think to myself, and I think Jeff brought this up beautifully. I never think to myself, I better not call Jeff. He's too wealthy and too busy. <laughs> I never, it just doesn't cross my mind. Maybe it should because he is busy, but I still make that phone call. <laughs> it doesn't bother me at all. Guys, to God be the glory. I hope you enjoyed. Again, Opinion Podcast. Please check us out. And again, I'm super excited. Uh, Craig told me this week that we have reached out now to four different continents somehow. Wow. Uh, and, they're, and they're not even VPNs. At first, I thought it was, but then we had the thing, it confirmed. So those of you that are overseas, our Eastern European connection, I appreciate you. Uh, but we got to find someone in the North and South Pole, obviously. Gotta... <laughs> <laughs> Yemen, we're coming for you. All right, guys, I hope you enjoy your day and to God be the glory. Thanks so much.